So hello um, to everyone. Welcome to Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. Today is Saturday, December 9th, and I am your moderator, James. I'm CGS Program Officer. Uh, Donna is moderate, uh, monitoring the chat, so please don't uh, hesitate to reach out to her if you have questions or need tech support. Um, the author of today's book, of course, is uh, Manu Bhagavan, who has been with us now for three previous sessions. Um, he will provide a comprehensive introduction uh, to the chapters we'll be going through today in just a moment. Um, first, though, some housekeeping. So we're recording today's session and it'll be available on CGS's YouTube channel by midweek. If this is anyone's first time, I want to say, first of all, hello, but also encourage you just to uh, introduce yourselves to the rest of us. Some of the book club uh, members have been gathering for some time, so it's quite a good group. Everyone knows each other and you should feel uh, open to participate. Um, today is the fourth session with Manu uh, and his book, The Peacemakers, India and the Quest for One World. We're really pleased to have him with us again. So far, the sessions have been brilliant and we're really looking forward to another to wrap us up. Um, to ensure there's enough time for everyone to ask questions, I'm going to ask um, that we set a community agreement uh, that you keep your questions uh, and comments to just two minutes. Um, if you go over that, I will interject just to remind you to try to keep to the time limit so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. Um, the schedule will remain the same as last time and with previous sessions. So Manu will kick us off with his thoughts on the chapter we've covered, uh, we're covering in today's session. Um, then we'll open up for questions at about 12.30. You can raise your hand virtually or physically um, if you'd like to ask questions, or you can put them in the chat box and Donna will raise them uh, when we get time. Um, we'll stop about 10 minutes before the end. That's about 1.20. Um, for any announcements that you may have, I would ask you if you do have any uh, topics you'd like to cover or announcements make, to make um, today, please keep them to the end if they're not on the topic of the book. Um, so now it is my very great pleasure to again uh, introduce Manu Bhagavan, who is uh, speaking with us today. Manu is the Professor of History, Human Rights and Public Policy at Hunter College and the Graduate Center, the uh, City U University of New York, where he is also a Senior Fellow at the Ralph Butch Institute for International Studies. He's the author of eight books, sorry, author and editor of eight books. Um, Manu, I will ask you again, as I have in previous weeks, since we have some new people with us, to plug your new book at the end of the session, just so everybody remembers, which is coming out soon. Today is the fourth session of Manu's book, Manu's book and I'd now like to hand over to you, Manu, um, to give us highlights and insights from chapter five in the close. Thanks very much. Okay. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out again. Um, I'm amazed that all of you are not completely sick of me at this point um, and uh, admire your commitment to um, this listening to me drone on and on about this book. I really have never had such in-depth engagement about anything I've ever done. Uh, so um, this is really quite remarkable. And I, just a, a word of gratitude to all of you uh, for... Uh, your interest and uh, all of the thoughtful um, questions and answers that come afterwards. Uh, I usually learn the most from that, so um, I, uh, I look forward to that stage the most. Um, okay, so today's the last day on this book, um, and the reading was for the final chapter and the epilogue. So rather than kind of going through it as a summary, what I thought I'd do is uh, just give a quick outline of what it was what was covered. And then I'm going to highlight uh, two of the major takeaways from this reading. And then the epilogue sort of brings us through to today. But um, since the book was published, I've written a whole lot of different things um, that elaborate on those points. So what I thought I'd do is engage with that stuff um, as a way of making the book speak to today a bit more thoroughly. Uh, and then uh, mention the the uh, the last the last thing that James asked me to, which is the the book that I'm working on or the book that's about to come out. Uh, okay, so um, the book overall is about India's quest for one world, which is a, a euphemism for uh, a world 
uh, federal government, um, but also for a united planet where um, diplomacy reigns, uh, war is averted, uh, and a, a supranational entity helps to maintain the peace and, and provides the basics of understanding between different countries. Um, so the overall chapter uh, deals with a couple of points. Uh, it deals with um, the history of human rights and particularly the two international covenants of human rights um, and what happened, how did they come about, what happened to them. Uh, and then it talks about uh, the Bandung Conference um, and uh, the emergence of uh, the non-aligned movement. Uh, it focuses in a lot on Nehru and his concerns uh, and uh, his hopes, the way the kinds of dreams that he had and the ways that he pushed them. Um, it talks about how he faced some difficulties, particularly in 1956 with the Suez crisis and with Hungary. Uh, and then it um, the with the epilogue culminates in his ultimate disillusionment after the Sino-Indian War when India was invaded by China. Um, uh, then at the same time, there's an, um, the other character that's important in the in the book is uh, Nehru's sister that in the book referred to as Madam Pandit, um, the J. Lakshmi Pandit. Uh, and she's um, she's kind of the undercurrent uh, who holds it all together. Um, and the chapter also talks about her period uh, of um, the, the period in which she served as president of the UN General Assembly be, when she was the first woman to do so. Uh, and uh, she was also ambassador to Moscow, ambassador to Washington, and so she embodied a lot of the agenda of uh, the Indian side. Uh, and then it uh, kind of culminates with this moment when after Nehru feels broken, she keeps the faith and then pushes it further. So that's um, the basic order of the chapter. So what I thought I'd do now is talk a little bit more in depth about two things from the reading and then uh, and then this sort of relevancy to today. The first is on human rights history. So um, this is particularly important. Yes, uh, William just posted this. This is particularly important because tomorrow is the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which we just had uh, the good grace to uh, celebrate at Roosevelt House uh, Public Policy Institute, which is part of Hunter. Uh, with Navi Pillay um, and um, the, the UN's former High Commissioner of Human Rights uh, and um, Meryl Streep, uh, who acted as uh, who acted as Eleanor Roosevelt, and they had a conversation. It was this kind of pretty amazing, amazing thing, um, and that read, in, in, engaged with the Universal Declaration. So it was it was a, a, a remarkable. Uh, okay, so on the subject of human rights, um, one of the great controversies over human rights has been the fact that, A, the original conception of human rights was broken into two parts. Um, uh, one part, civil and political liberties, the other, economic, social, and cultural rights, um, were then attached to two covenants, which were going to serve as the basis for the international application of these ideas. And for the longest time, the historical understanding of this was that uh, the United States was responsible for pushing the break of the covenants, uh, the break of human rights into two covenants, um, and that the reason was that they only preferred um, civil and political liberties. Um, and then this was, the evidence for this was um, in the way in which human rights organizations uh, like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International then pushed, uh, and previously, the previous incarnation of Human Rights Watch, Helsinki Watch, pushed civil and political liberties. Um, 
so um, my book is a, a real intervention on this whole argument, and it kind of it came out around the same time as Sam Moyne uh, produced a book called The Last Utopia, and the two of us uh, sort of upend that entire line of thinking. Um, the first is that um, it was not the United States that split the covenant, uh, that split human rights into two covenants, it was India, and that's what's uh, in the book. Uh, and so to explain why this is, now, um, again, for the longest time, many um, critics of human rights uh, argued that the splitting into two was a fault, uh, and that it was a way of marginalizing economic, social, and cultural rights and pushing them off to the side. That did that. The marginalization of them did happen, but that wasn't because of the splitting. That's what my um, intervention is. Um, they also see conspiracy that the U.S. sort of did this very purposefully. So, um, first of all, none of that is true. Uh, the United States was not the person that no, was not the the group that um, led the initiative to uh, split the covenant. Although they ultimately came around to supporting it. Um, and uh, the Soviet, as you see in the chapter, the Soviets were opposed. Um, but it was India who really felt strongly that there were two lineages of rights. Um, basically, what happened is as they were discussing it, um, there was the idea that certain rights uh, were negative rights. Mm, governments just didn't need to do anything. And people, individuals inherently had rights to themselves. Um, as long as the state stayed out of it, uh, freedom would exist, say freedom of religion, for example. Um, the As long as the state stays out of it, people are free to worship as they uh, will, other than the protection of individuals from other individuals. The state doesn't need to do anything to grant people the ability to practice their own faith. Um, contrary to that are rights where people need things. Um, the right to food, the right to clean water, the right to education, positive rights, where the government needs to supply things. Um, and uh, this, as the discussions about human rights went on in the United Nations, um, they quickly determined that these were two very different kinds of rights. So India felt that the lineages of these rights were very different. And rather than trying to hammer them together in a way that uh, was dissonant, um, they argued that they should be split into two twin covenants and then as separate documents put into harmony with one another. That is that they would complement one another as opposed to kind of tripping over themselves in the same document. It also recognized that by splitting them, these different lineages. So, uh, what that meant was it was a recognition and affirmation of difference, of difference of thought, of difference of history, of difference of points of view. Um, and then by acknowledging that, saying that both of these were valid and that we needed both in order to proceed. It's also, of course, not entirely, it's not true that the United States did not see or understand that there were two kinds of rights. Um, the four freedoms of FDR uh, involved um, what might be termed positive rights with the, with the from, um, parts of the four freedoms, the freedom from fear and the freedom from want, um, particularly the freedom from want, uh, which involved um, welfareism as a as a regressive measure. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's a one element of the history of human rights, uh, which the chapter covers and and is very important. Um, the second intervention of the chapter of the book is about India's contributions to international affairs in the middle of the Cold War. Um, and this involves the policy of non-alignment, which is often seen as the basis of Indian um, foreign policy. And for the longest time was argued that that's all that it was. It was just non-alignment. Many people misunderstood non-alignment to mean neutrality, which means that you had two different um, sides, a bipolar world. Um, and nuclear catastrophe looming and non-alignment was about saying uh, we're essentially neutral or pa we're pacifist, things of this sort. And what I um, argue in the book is that none of that is correct, that non-alignment uh, was um, uh, but a plank uh, in the larger policy. And larger policy, the larger policy goal was one world. So non-alignment is a way, is a method 
of acting. And that's the Gandhian element um, in foreign policy. So a lot of the chapter, uh, a lot of the time of the chapter is spent on um, the application of Gandhi's ideas to international affairs. So here, I think it's just useful to say, I mentioned it before, that for Gandhi, the idea of validation of the other is very important. Uh, and the other, even if the other is someone who is oppressive or is uh, is um, at odds with you, you still recognize and validate some aspects of the other, um, uh, even as you disagree on positions. Um, and that creates a kind of respect, and that respect is what in turn helps to turn the thing on which the disagreement hinges. Um, so um, non-alignment is essentially that. It's about maintaining friendship and respect with all parties, particularly all parties in the midst of the Cold War. Um, and then by being friends, that doesn't mean that you uh, are allies, that you draw in on one side uh, on, in the middle of any conflict, that you're an automatic uh, yes on anything that they do, um, nor does it mean that you're afraid to, to that you just sort of keep quiet. Um, instead, um, friendship with both sides meant that uh, when one side was mistaken, India expected to be able to call them out and say, this is an error, we disagree with you, how about you try it this way? While Nehru was the prime minister, because of his nature, this was something that worked, but um, one of the dangers, the risks of this position is in hypocrisy or in um, the sense that uh, does India not make any mistakes and what does India do when it is criticized? Uh, so we'll just kind of parenthetically put that aside. That would be true for any country doing these kinds of things. Um, Nehru's response to that, though, however, was the Nehru's response to that, though, was that. Um, the supranational principles that people agree on, i.e. international human rights, binds all states, including India, to those principles. And all states are responsible to, uh, to live up to them. Um, so you, India would subject itself uh, freely to those principles. And there, were there was evidence that he at least tried, even on things he disagreed with, to push um, areas where India was criticized uh, to the United Nations, where he would try to abide by some of the claims, at the very least. Um, this is area, these are gray areas here, um, easily arguable. Obviously, one of the biggest ones here is on the issue of Kashmir in India. Um, okay, so those are the two kind of big things. I, I have about um, eight minutes left here at the outset. So what I'd like to do now is talk about the application of things uh, from this point forward. We wound up with two covenants. Many countries around the world uh, wound up ratifying them. A couple big ones did not. Uh, but nonetheless, um, this is the basis of the international order. Um, much of the vision of, of what is articulated in the book obviously has not come to pass. We have human rights. Human rights feel like they've been eroding. Um, in the last decade plus, um, and certainly over over time in general, we haven't seen a supranational, real supranational ent entity. We don't have, I mean, the United Nations is a weak form. The United Nations has lost a lot of credibility, uh, is often chastised for being either ineffective or corrupt. Um, and um, United Nations uh, peacekeepers have themselves engaged in terrible kinds of activities. So how did we get here? What do we do and what's the situation that we're facing? Well, the first situation, the biggest situation that we're facing um, is what, what we've been noticing, um, which is an erosion in faith in democracy around the world. This has been document, well documented by uh, social scientists uh, and it's a global phenomenon and very worrying. Um, the uh, other thing that we're seeing is a relative ineffectiveness of any um, group of countries or international body to really move the needle on some of the major kinds of problems that we're facing. Uh, and so where does this leave us? So in a whole lot of different kinds of essays and talks and public fora, um, I've tried to engage with this. And essentially, my argument is as follows. Uh, we're in the midst of what I call a global authoritarian moment. The recession of faith in democracy 
uh, and an increasing turn towards authoritarian or strongman leaders uh, around the world who uh, no longer have commitment to basic democratic principles and are unafraid to uh, use the power of the state, uh, both internally and externally, uh, to whatever their personal ends are. Um, my explanation for this is as follows. Um, from the 1990s moving forward, for a variety of reasons that I don't have time to get into now, uh, we have um, uh, seen uh, a triple form of globalization. The globalization of the economy, the globalization of conflict, and the globalization of crises. The globalization of the economy, uh, too complicated to get into here, but essentially involves changes in the World Trade Organization and trade rules dating back to the 1970s, resulting in very powerful multinational corporations, uh, which uh, grew over the course of 90s globalization and forward into the 2000s. These multinational entities grew to be so large and with disaggregated chains of production from the trade rule changes, um, that they now exist in ways that exceed the power of any single government, including that of the United States, to fully regulate them. They just exist as these transnational entities, multinational entities, uh, wielding tremendous power and being able to influence policies within states as well. This is what I call global corporatism um, and the globalization of the economy. Um, the second is uh, the globalization of conflict uh, that stems in part from back to 9-11 um, and the, the global war on terror. Um, from that point forward, uh, we've seen this kind of increase in insecurity around the world as state and non-state actors um, have felt free to attack people anywhere at any time. Um, and that has undermined people's sense of security and self. Um, and also uh, an idea that uh, there was a visible, viable future uh, ahead of them. And the more they felt insecure, the more that they felt their um, uh, future is at risk, the more they have leaned back on um, trying to protect themselves uh, in a variety of ways. Um, this is the globalization of conflict. And the war on terror, by the way, has never ended. We're still, we're still technically uh, ongoing. Um, and we layer in a whole series of affiliated conflicts from there as well. And the last one is the globalization of uh, crises. These include things like um, health, um, the, the spread of disease. Um, uh, originally, when I first started talking about this, this was things like Zika and Ebola. But of course, now the coronavirus pandemic uh, makes this as clear as possible um, that um, disease, uh, um, things driven by nature, and obviously catastrophic climate change uh, impact people everywhere, and no government has the ability to really shield uh, their population fully from these things. Once they start in one part of the world, they easily spread all over. Uh, so the globalization of crises, uh, that together means that we have the globalization of the economy, the globalization of conflict, and the globalization of crises. These three things means that we have, these three things together mean that we have um, an international set of problems which uh, have completely eroded people's sense of self, security, safety. Um, and uh, they there is also kind of an imminent a sense of imminence to all of this, that um, you know, we need to fix the problems now. Um, democratic govern governments um, who have had to work independently have simply been unable to deliver any kind of measures for these problems because the problems are so huge and international that no single government has the ability to do it. And it's for that reason uh, that uh, they have looked um, flat-footed um, and uh, it's in the context of that that we see authoritarian strongmen around the world claiming that they alone can fix things, that they will um, make their countries great again, or whatever. Um, variations of these themes uh, that we see repeatedly all around the world um, uh, in variations, but the variations are minor. Um, the, the, this is just the same kind of thing said over and over and over again. 
Uh, all of this is wrapped uh, in the bow of xenophobia and jingoism, uh, where essentially the, the, the idea is to blame somebody, uh, usually a minority community inside uh, the state or a peripheral community next next door, neighborly, and blame them for all of the problems. Uh, this directs people's energy towards something that they feel that they can handle, that they kind of direct their uh, animosity towards that. But in reality, no problems are actually being solved. So the argument basically is that we're at a very pivotal moment. Um, the old international order, the international order born of World War II has not helped us because it has been too limited. Uh, and it didn't have it didn't have the uh, sure footedness. It wasn't it wasn't fleet enough in order to be able to um, to act quickly uh, to deal with these kinds of things. Um, and um, this threat, uh, moreover, has made it even weaker, the authoritarian threat. Um, and the problems themselves are so gargantuan and international and climate change is only getting uh, is only going to make things worse. Um, leaving us with really a, a pivot point. Uh, we're, we're at a very dangerous moment. Um, if uh, authoritarians uh, continue to rack up victories, um, the place that they will take the world uh, inevitably is back to kind of a 19th century form of imperialism and war. Um, and uh, we're seeing that play out in parts of the world already. Uh, and the more of those that spread, the more likely global catastrophe, global catastrophic conflict uh, be becomes. Um, and so that is a possibility. Um, returning to the old liberal order is a possibility, but um, it has, it was even at its peak ineffective at stopping some of these things. In fact, it was responsible for some of them as with global corporatism. Uh, and so that is something for us to uh, consider. Uh, and that leaves us therefore with the third possibility, which is to reimagine uh, a world order, uh, which um, it has some deliverables for everybody and is able to kind of grapple with these big international concerns uh, in an effective way. Um, which is all of which is to say, and I realize I'm a minute over here, uh, all of which is to say that um, it is not idealistic and um, uh, it is not too fantastic uh, to sit and talk about uh, world federalist solutions because um, not only is not only are they realistic as the only realistic solution to our problems, but they're also fundamentally necessary ones. That is, you must have responsive global federalist structures in place in order to be able to be responsive to the people, uh, the local people's needs, and these kind of bigger problems which have overtaken us and will continue to overtake us if we don't act fast. So I think I'll stop there. I'm happy to talk uh, in um, more detail with people. There's, um, I think, looks like one person has put a lot of things into the chat, which I, I can't read all of that. So if someone just wants to encapsulate that for me, I mean, I can, but it's just uh, someone wants to tell me what I need to respond to. That would be helpful. Okay, thank you, um, uh, James. Terrific, Manu, thank you. Um, some heady and in some cases, scary thoughts there. Um, so maybe we can start. Does anybody like to kick us off with a question? Got Bob raised his hand. Would you like to start? Sure. Thank you. Um, yes. Well. Well. First, thank you for that uh, wonderful synopsis. I mean, I found that very enlightening and very helpful. If there are any papers that you've written specifically pointed toward what you said in the last few minutes, in addition, of course, to the last chapter of the book, I would love if you can put that in the chat. Um, so anyway, so thank you with that. But my question is that in, in a recent WFM meeting, uh, the historian Joseph Barada um, said that, you know, in order to have a World Federation, in order to move in that direction, you need at least one country to kind of step out and declare that we're for this. I mean, right now, no country is doing that. So when, when he said that, what came to mind for me is India. And, and the reason I thought of India 
um, was that you, you may know of uh, Jagdish Gandhi's, um, what is it, annual meeting of uh, Supreme Court justices from around the world, where they meet and talk about World Federation. And he's been doing this for, you know, over a dozen years. And, and, and at his conferences, um, there are many um, leaders, political leaders from India that fly in and present there. And they all seem to be on board about World Federation. So I was kind of amazed that, that you know, I don't know how far reaching his influence is in India, uh, but I've been there and I've seen mayors and governors and, um, you know, other leaders uh, come and talk about it. And I've never heard of that in any other country. So, um, and so bracketing off Modi for a moment uh, and where his head is at, that um, what do you think about that? I mean, do you think that India... Um, could lead the charge, or is that just uh, an illusion that I made up? <laughs> so, thank you. Um, this is a this is a bit of a complicated question to answer because um, it, it involves a couple of different things. So, which is to say I have to fill in a little bit about the, the ideology of the current government in order to explain it. Um, so the current government of India, led by Narendra Modi, is a right-leaning government, right-wing government, that subscribes to principles of Hindu nationalism. This is not controversial. They themselves, this is what they say. Um, uh, and um, in doing that, they, in many ways, try to disavow um, cosmopolitan elements within India and um, international uh, elements within the country as well. That is, they're very keen to say, we're part of a 5,000 year old history and we're, we want to draw only from that heritage, uh, which is a very Hindu heritage in, in their view. Um, but funnily enough, one particular philosophy, which goes far back, is called Vasudeva Kutumbakam, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. And what that essentially means is the world is one family or one world. Um, and that's a frame phrase that both Nehru and Madam Pandit used in their day as well. Uh, and the um, the current Indian government has used it to talk about it. It's foreign policy. It just used that as the hallmark of the big international meeting that India just hosted. Uh, and so, um, in a sense, there is agreement across parties on the idea of internationalism uh, and um, uh, some kind of, well, some kind of like one, one world, one family position. Um, what that means in practice is very unclear. India believes in multilateralism. Uh, it believes in multilateral institutions. Certainly all of its diplomats, which are highly trained, um, and it's uh, and the uh, foreign minister uh, are very, very capable of talking about this. Modi himself, on the international stage, always talks uh, the language of liberalism, of people coming together, and this kind of stuff. What he's concerned about is saying that India should be, be this um, kind of Hindu state, but within that, he's he's happy for other people to be however they want to be in the way that he talks on the international stage. So. Um, in that sense, there's continuity uh, and, again, cross-party commitment to these ideas. What they mean in practice can be a little bit murky. Um, you know, multilateralism, if you, if by multilateralism you mean that everybody on this, on the world stage is perpetually equal and you're afraid to call out people who are making mistakes, um, or engaging in violence, uh, that's not really multilateralism. That's just an old state sovereignty system. 
uh, where independent states act as they will and everybody just minds their own business. Um, so uh, if on the other hand, you have kind of a strong international commitment to preventing anyone from doing uh, from doing anything out of uh, anything unacceptable, uh, then it might work. And these positions here become vague in part because India itself is is taking more dangerous positions. Of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with the two assassination plots that's been called out on, one in Canada and one in the United States. Um, obviously in violation of everything and that it shouldn't and should not be doing that. Um, but it's claim, you know, it's the precedent is the United States action of pursuit of terrorists around the world, uh, including in any other state and its its ability to do that. And, and so India's position is, well, these people are avowed terrorists. This is what they're saying. We're going to go after them. It's a multilateral position um, in that sense. So you see, it's complicated. Uh, it's it's one of these things where uh, good for the goose, good for the gander is essentially their point of view. Um, and in an anti-imperialist sense, that can be that can make sense, can be fruitful. But if you take that too far, it just basically means that everybody will act as horribly as they want, uh, as maximally as they want uh, up to the point. So I don't know that that's really going to get us somewhere. Someone has to say, uh, well, we all could be doing that, but this is terrible. So what we want is for everyone to kind of lean in on being better, uh, on being better people and not just talking about being better. Um, so at this point, I think the more likely um, way forward um, is rather than trying to rely on a specific country is to rely on civil society organizations to push things. Um, I I don't I can't think of um, anyone with the ability right this minute to say this is where we need to go or this is what we need to do. Um, I think we have to build consensus, and I think the safer way forward is to kind of get a couple of different groups of people or representatives from different places to get on board. I think you might actually find the more the more the more viable person maybe maybe would be someone like Lula uh, in Brazil. Uh, uh, but, you know, Latin America is about to have its own major, possibly its own major conflict with Venezuela and Guyana. I don't know if you know that there's this conflict building up uh, over uh, over a disputed territory between Guyana and Venezuela, and um, Guyana is an ally of India and the United States, and the Guyanese president has called on both India and the United States and a third country as well to intervene on its behalf. Uh, and it, this involves like militaries moving around. This could turn into yet another uh, hotspot in the world. So another concerning thing over there, um, and we don't want to idealize anything more about Argentina has just um, its left-leaning Peronists have lost and uh, a, they're a far-right candidate has just come to power in Argentina. So it's not like there's any one world, uh, one part of the world where everyone is in agreement. Um, uh, and you know, that's I think that's where I'd leave it. I think our right now the best way forward is um, as many civil society organizations as possible, uh, trying to come together, putting forward statements, and broadening it beyond advocacy groups like yours. Um, it has to be other kinds of groups as well, sort of saying that this is what we need as a way forward. Great, thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, Gail, you're next up, I believe. Um, I, um, I, I take your point about um, that um, the, the problems are so overwhelming that governments aren't able to solve them. I mean, that's the whole thing about global problems need global solutions. We don't have the, you know, the global organizations to deal with problems that cannot possibly be solved by individual governments. But also, I, I, I question whether you say um, people are opposed to democracy. I don't necessarily think they're opposed to democracy because like the US is not a democracy. According to studies that have been done, it's actually um, you know, uh, um, an oligarchy. So maybe people aren't opposed to democracy per se, if we actually had 
democracies in these countries, maybe they would work better and maybe people would not be opposed to their governments, which would be interpreted as being opposed to democracy. Anyway, that's that's really just a, a comment. But I, my broader question is the one that I raised in the email. Um, what generated, do you think, uh, these great leaders like Nehru and Madam Pandit? And I'm thinking, too, of great leaders in South Africa, Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu and so on. And how can, you know, I, I'm a structuralist. I think that um, we can do things to provide a structure that would encourage the rise of good leadership rather than bad leadership. And I'm wondering what what ideas you would have. One thing that you mentioned is sub multiple subsidiarities. So instead of just having um, governments, national governments as subsidiary, to have other kinds of subsidiarities. And that's just something that, that popped out at me as something that may, may be useful to explore. Thank you, Gail. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I it, in terms of um, the democracy question, uh, I obviously I inequality and oligarchies, uh, you know, are are part of the problem. Um, there uh, obviously have a long, long been many leftist critiques of that potential within um, liberal democracy. Um, but uh, what I'd say is that there are um, all kinds of things like the Journal of Democracy, people that study democracy, um, I, I could pull it up if I have a second, uh, that have put out uh, studies of um, international faith and democracy and uh, meaning in, within different democratic spheres. And the decline is noticeable, recognizable, statistically significant, uh, and it is across the board in country after country after country after country after country. There's uh, decline in faith in democratic institutions, norms, and principles. It's very worrisome. Um, and I, I don't think we can address the authoritarian rise of authoritarianism unless we uh, address that. Now, if the claim is, well, it's declining because uh, of this uh, terrible the terrible inequality that has arisen, I would, I would agree that that is in fact part of the problem. Um, it is part of the problem in stemming from 1980s uh, efforts at uh, dis dismantling uh, the public state uh, with a move to um, privatize everything with IMF and World Bank initiatives around the world uh, that followed this um, principle um, uh, and um, uh, other such things overall created a system in which um, you know just magnificent inequality was uh, was allowed to to um, mobilize on the other hand um, um, you know when big programs are put in place and we have in I, I don't have this at my fingertips but um, I believe we have economic indicators to show uh, that in the last few years for instance the United States has begun to, to turn that around uh, and make progress um, in on some uh, equality indicators, economic equality indicators, um, it hasn't had an impact uh, in terms of people's um, perceptions of, of of requirements or the popularity of uh, of uh, right wing figures. It hasn't impacted that either yet. And the people, the right wing figures that they're advocating, want more of the old, more the other policies. So, so there isn't an explanation for that other than other than maybe um, kind of uh, the power of cults uh, to overtake public discourse. And uh, once you sort of get enamored by that, the, the material facts no longer matter. But it's it's complicated. A cult of personality is what I'm referring to. Um, so there's that. Um, and I'm I'm sorry. I, oh, the other the other part was about leaders. I stuck one more thing into the uh, chat. Um, which is an article that I wrote uh, with um, a graduate student of mine called The Commodification of Love. Um, and it explains, in my view, what was a central element of a Gandhi or of a Nelson Mandela or a, a Martin Luther King, um, which was that they were all able to 
to operate um, in a political reality that allowed for them to use the construct of the language of love uh, as a actual political method or tool. Um, Martin Luther King talked about this all the time. Mandela talk, used it, Desmond Tutu used it, Gandhi used it. Now, when they use the term love, they're using um, the kind of Christian agape form of love. Uh, that is the love of God, uh, God's love, um, universal love, the love of humanity, that kind of thing. Um, and then that can still be very personal, the bonds that people share uh, that that can kind of keep people together um, and be very influential. Um, and I, in this article, I explain how the concept of love moves away from that kind of Christian sense, agape sense. It's not just Christian. But I'm just using the, the, the agape form there of love. Uh, to um, it, it, The concept of love, the argument in the paper is be essentially becomes commodified uh, over the 1960s uh, when it it becomes it, in part uh, and for very good reasons, but it becomes popularized uh, and consumerable through uh, huge forces like the Beatles uh, or uh, advertisements for Coca-Cola. And these things which talk about love there then make them make love this kind of concept, which is, um, more in line with what we call ero, the kind of love derived from eros or erotic love. Um, and there's a transition which where love then becomes uh, kind of this um, commercial uh, kind of thing and less viable as a political reality. By the 1980s, if people walked around and said, we need to love one another, they were considered kooks, um, not people who were able to, to actually uh, deploy um, um, love. And only Nelson Mandela, when he came out of prison, was able to sort of briefly use this, but only he, he and Desmond Tutu, and only for a brief moment, and then uh, and then that again went away. No one else could really get away with it. Uh, and so part of that is about the, um, you know, the way in which love language uh, plays a role and and how important that is. The more we marginalize that kind of language, the less likely we are to see like uh, leaders uh, of that kind. Um, and leaders of that kind, the last thing is, is leaders of that kind exist in part because there's a, a, um, a mass base, a, su a support for these kinds of ideas. Um, so they don't exist in a vacuum and they aren't the source for it. People are, are sort of willing to listen to that. So you need both. Uh, and you need a receptive population. So I would say, again, it's not so much that we need to sit and try to create new leaders. We need to work on educating people more broadly uh, and attuning them to the possibility of these things. The more of that that happens, the more likely uh, leaders of that kind will emerge spontaneously from such groups. Terrific. Um, so I'll just run through an order. We've got a few questions. Um, Barat and then uh, Christopher Roth, um, if you'd like to go after Barat, and then Bob and then Carla. Um, so there's a couple of questions to get through, so if you can all be quite brief, please. But first, uh, Barat, would you like to go first? Did you would. My 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 turn. Yep. Oh, good. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Manu for this, uh, and for you, James, and all of you folks for for doing this. Uh, and uh, during the first presentation, I was uh, a couple points. One, uh, the validation of the other was important to Gandhi. And uh, I think that is very important to validate the other. And uh, in regards to the country I live in, the United States, uh, that's very difficult because uh, to validate the MAGA movement uh, seems frankly a bit nuts. However, uh, I would like to suggest just a thought that occurred to me. Ronald Reagan, who was a big hero to the conservative people in uh, our country, um, often said that America was the city on the hill. Uh, he liked to talk about how America could set a great example for the world. And I do believe that's one of the few, few things that I agree with about Ronald Reagan. And so... Uh, back in reference to what Bob had mentioned earlier, what country could lead? And I don't think if there's any country that could lead toward world unity, 
effectively it would be the United States because the United States obviously the biggest economic and military power in the world if the United States were to begin to change and, and propose something like world unity rather than the globalization of the economy and all that sort of thing uh, that would be very helpful I think and um, I think that one way that that could be done would be through civil disobedience uh, and civil disobedience because America is meant to be the light of the world and the beacon on the uh, on the hill. So we could say to the MAGA people, if you really want world peace and you really want uh, a, a better world, then perhaps we could be the beacon on the hill and we could begin to try to globalize civil disobedience. Uh, we mentioned you mentioned uh, Manu mentioned globalization of the economy, conflict, and crisis, which I think we all, fifteen of us here on this Zoom meeting, would probably agree. Uh, how can we? My, my question for everyone is: How can we begin to globalize uh, uh, civil disobedience? And that would be, of course, by starting here in the United States with civil disobedience. And I believe that we're in a good position to do that in the United States because we have what, what is called a justice system, which requires trials for people who break laws. And uh, we know from history here in America that if we have enough people breaking laws through civil disobedience at the same time, and all of them demanding a jury trial, the so-called justice system is not able to cope with that. You have yeah. two minutes. So, it, Christopher, yes. you've That's been going on. For, okay. okay. All right. Oh, did you, was there a question there for the speaker? Well, my question just... was, does anyone believe that we can somehow or another, by starting in America, eventually globalize civil disobedience? Uh, because that is the, apparently, be, looking at Mandela and Gandhi and King, the way you can get some change without being violent. Thank you, Christopher. Manu, uh, do you have any thoughts on that topic? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be fast. What I would say is that there are lots of people and lots of activists around the world who have tried. Um, let me just stick to India for a minute. Lots of activists in India who tried for many years after Gandhi to say, oh, I'll do this, I'll do that. And it it's a form of civil protest and it will attract attention. These include things like strikes or fasting uh, or whatever. And it's not really worked. Uh, and over time, you know, people just sort of say, OK, well, whatever. And um, and uh, in my view, there's two problems. Uh, one is that Gandhi had a very holistic philosophy. And so everything he was doing, any one thing he was doing was part of a whole structural package of things uh, and uh, and integrated with a core philosophy. And that core philosophy was grounded in the principle of love, the bond of love. Uh, on the other side of the world, Evita Peron whatever her political proclivities, also used this bond. She called it the bridge of love uh, in her side, which also resulted in the same kind of thing, this incredible bond she had with the people and magnetic personality, all of that. Um, only if you kind of have that uh, and you're able to, to sort of uh, build on that. Now, the difference between Evita and, uh, and Gandhi was that Gandhi applied this principle even to the people he opposed. Um, but that's what allowed him to, to do these things and where people would react. If he fasted against people, it was also under the premise that he loved them and that they loved him and that would move them to act, that the love would force them to act. Uh, so civil disobedience, although he's drawing from, um, you know, civil disobedience as a concept draws from American heritage with Thoreau, um, uh, it's, it's modified uh, by a whole bunch of things by Gandhi um, into this sort of like mm, political civil disobedience. Um, so I would say that, uh, yes, it's, you know, there's a, America has a whole history of protests and protest movements do have impact and they do succeed. There's a distinction between protest and Gandhian civil disobedience. Um, and uh, again, holistic things there are what's necessary for the Gandhian side. And the last thing about just, you mentioned reaching out to MAGA, uh, what I say is that um, this is a very challenging thing. Lynn, Lynn Cheney, for example, uh, Liz Cheney, for example, writes in her new book that her mother, Lynn Cheney, had a lifelong friend of 60 years 
uh, and they they broke over their view of Trump. Um, in which case, the uh, the person's commitment to Trump was it exceeded a sixty year personal relationship. That's highly unusual. Usually, personal relationships are the most important things in people's lives, and they'll put everything aside you know, so to sort of push things like the particularly close bonds. That was one area one one could play on. Um, but on the other hand, the Cheneys are special um, and they were leading the charge and, you know, it, it might be realms of exception. Um, what it means, though, is not that you validate MAGA's principles. Gandhi would be opposed to that. Um, MAGA's principles are, are things that if you disagree with, you must express your disagreement. You must disagree. Um, what you have to validate is the person um, and understand that whatever is driving them uh, is coming from fear or anger or resentment, whatever it is, but that there are other qualities that they can that can be validated in them. And sometimes validating those principles and seeing them, the, the, you know, this sort of cliche, I see you, uh, saying that and, and sort of making them feel seen and heard can uh, diffuse anger and resentment. Um, I wouldn't say it's easy, and sometimes it can enrage people further. One has to be very careful with this, but I do think ultimately it is the only way forward. It is the only way forward. We have people have to make inroads with the people they disagree with. They have to be validated as people. They cannot be, you know, disregarded and, and just pushed aside. This is true with any disagreement. Uh, and then, and then um, one can disagree fully and be committed to the disagreement politically. But the, the people behind those disagreements have to be validated up to a point there. There are, uh, for example, uh, Hitler was not someone that Gandhi needed to validate uh, and ultimately was his, you know, was his antithesis, antithesis. It was the Moriarty to Gandhi's homes. So um, the people, the masses, yes. Um, perpetrators of terrible things, no. Like they, they should be brought to justice uh, and they don't need to be validated. Um, so, um, well, I'll leave it there because there's a lot of hands. Thank you, Manu. Um, Bharat, would you like to go next with your question? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask a question going back into your text. On page 134, you talk about the special technique that... Uh, the magic of Gandhi that Nehru uses in trying to uh, get the human rights uh, covenants uh, uh, supported. And so I would appreciate if you could expand a little bit in the nature of the technique. I mean, we all know about Satyagra, we know about the general, uh, but it would be interesting to see how specifically how this Gandhian technique would work in persuading, you know, differing minds of people to agree to uh, something in common. And uh, corollary to that, I would like to ask a second question, is that you uh, wonderfully uh, summarize the three uh, issues of the, our present time the uh, uh, economy, the global globalization of economy, globalization of crisis, globalization of uh, conflict. I would like to ask you how that technique would work and how one apply that technique in trying to solve uh, or resolve the issues uh, coming out of those specific three contemporary issues. Anyway, that's my question. Yeah, thank you. Once again, uh, in 30 seconds, let me attempt to solve the world's problems. Um, uh, quite challenging questions. Um, le le let me see. Uh, I, I think a couple of things. Um, first of all, let me explain. Uh, my, my fear is just with the amount of time we have, I don't want to go over. And there's still a couple of questions, but I'll do my best to kind of be concise here in answering. First, let me explain Gandhi and Satyagraha and the way that it works. Satyagraha or truth force also means love force. So I keep using, I come, keep coming back to this principle of love and why it's so fundamental. 
So let me just explain this so we understand where Gandhi is coming from, and then we'll talk about God, the application of this to international affairs. So Satyagraha, or Gandhi's campaigns of truth, uh, truth equals love equals God, is the way that he, that's the basic math of his of his uh, of his politics uh so everyone around the world universally shares truth all religions are versions of truth um truth capital t and therefore everyone fundamentally is uh, we we all share a bond uh a common bond and this is a, a bond of love, a bond of spiritual energy, uh, and it binds everyone together. Um, disagreements are often about dehumanization, to put it in more contemporary terms, or about dehumanization, Disagre violent disagreements uh, that lead to oppression often involve dehumanization. Satyagraha is based on the idea that you must get the oppressor to see the humanity of the people that they <coughs> humanized. In order to do that, however, the process of dehumanization involves not just a dehumanization of the other, by, by default, it involves the dehumanization of the self. Only a dehumanized self would allow it to be to practice dehumanization of another. So there's a twin dehumanization going on. So Gandhi says, that is to say, people who are dehumanizing in an oppressive sense, in their minds, feel dehumanized themselves. They feel like they're victims. They feel like they're uh, attacked. They, you know, things like that. That this is the in in measure that this is often what's driving it, or a sense of say racial superiority. But even then, it's about um, people not who don't deserve things getting, you know, things of this sort. There's different approach. Different, you know, this varies specific to specific, and we'd have to be specific uh, for any details here. But as in broad sense, this is true. So Satyagraha is based on the idea that if when you challenge someone, whether they have way more power than you, whether they have all the weapons in the world, whatever, but if you challenge them, if you valid, if you seek to validate their essence, their core, their humanity first, you see them, and Gandhi describes this as like turning on a light switch. You 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 turn on something in them, and, and they can't help it. It just happens uh, because your the respect you give them makes them feel something. And in that, when you do that, they and even if you resist, they feel compelled. There's a compulsion which then takes place. They feel compelled to at least move on the idea of respect back. And then you, once you have that bond established, you're able to then um, you know, politically disagree and, and try to come to some kind of compromise, the essence of all politics. Um, and the compromise, Gandhi also knew to compromise. So it's, it's about holding steadfast to your position and then finding uh, an acceptable, uh, negotiable end to the, to the, to the, to the matter while not conceding on the basics like one's humanity or, or, or any of that stuff. So on international affairs, uh, again, uh, if all one does is throw bombs, I mean, I meant verbal bombs, but obviously literal bombs would be bad too. Um, but if all one does is that, uh, or engages in dehumanization, acts of war, uh, then um, you, what the, the, this whole method is about avoiding acts of war. In the middle of a, a war, um, uh, while Gandhi perhaps might have been willing to say, well, you 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 use nonviolence even then, Nehru would not. Nehru would say in the middle of the war, you have to use violence to stop the violence. You know, you have to bring it to a halt. But then, and that's what's in the book, then you have to say the peace that follows is the key. So you have to keep that in your mind. The pe What do we do to get there? And that involves diplomacy. So ultimately, the Gandhian method is, is involves diplomacy, and it involves, in the context of the Cold War, you wouldn't pick a side. I'm with the United States, the Soviets are devils, or I'm with the Soviet Union, the United States are devils. That is not the way to say both sides have truth, and we have to figure out a way forward. We want to bridge the gap. That's, that's what 
I'm referring to here, that's what Nehru was referring to there, uh, about the Gandhian application in international affairs. Non-alignment is the application of Gandhian nonviolence to state-to-state -state relations in the middle of the Cold War. We're not in the middle of the Cold War anymore, although people are talking about a Cold War 2.0, or perhaps that the original Cold War has morphed into something, uh, it continue, has continued, and it's a little bit different now. So um, here we would need to set the parameters of what the, who the combatants are first. It's very vague. Um, and then you have to sort of plot ways forward. Um, I'd say, well, it's something, it's an exercise I might enjoy doing or in a way of trying to be helpful. It is not something I can do in just a few seconds here. Uh, so we'd have to kind of think about that um, thoroughly. Also, I wouldn't want to give it short shrift. Uh, obviously, it, I, don't, I don't want it to seem... Um, less than it is. It's it's a, obviously a big task. It's complicated, and it would involve uh, a lot of specifics. Um, here's where things can get very murky, is what I would say. Let's just take, for example, briefly, the case of Russia and Ukraine. Okay. Now, the Gandhian principle would say, you validate both sides. And what is Russia's position? So there's a number of Russianists, Russianists specialists on Russia, which would say they, these are the reasons why Russia might say the Ukraine is part of Russia or why it would be doing these things, whatever, whatever, whatever. And plenty of leftist arguments that uh, NATO expansion, et cetera, has a role to play in Russian actions. Um, on the other hand, uh, another argument about this is that this is Russian imperialism dating back uh, a, a long way, and we're validating um, uh, aggression and the lesson of um, um, Chamberlain and Czechoslovakia is appeasement. That is not something that you do. We risk much greater conflict if we don't stop Russia and Ukraine. So these are two very different kinds of approaches and arguments to a complex problem. Um, and how, how do you negotiate this in a way that makes sense? Uh, well, Gandhi was fundamentally an anti-imperialist, let's be clear about that. So <coughs> imperialism has to be at the heart of it. Um, at the same time, we all need to get along with Russia's not going anywhere. Russia isn't going anywhere. So we need to make sure that the Russian people don't feel, um, you know, that this is about their destruction or, or something of that sort. Uh, whereas um, what Putin is authorizing or where, what you, you make of uh, the leader, um, that, you know, is a different, that's, that, you know, you, again, that's one of those things that you kind of have to, have to figure out a way forward so that um, this is a, this is, I think it's fair to say an unrepresentative leader of the people. He's not, he's not validated by a real dem a democratic uh, mechanism. Uh, so, and that's complicated there. You know, you don't want to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. You certainly don't want to put him into a corner, uh, forcing him into some terrible thing. On the other hand, um, you know, I mean, there's lots of lots of analysis that goes in here. How weak is he? How strong is he? What would he do? Uh, and and we'd have to spend a lot of time uh, to sort of play that out. I think I just leave that here. It's a, an example of how complex it is and how specific one has to be in each case. Uh, but the basic tenets involve these. Uh, the basic idea is to involve these tenets. Terrific, thank you, um, Bob. Since you've already asked a question, do you mind if I? If I was just going to suggest. I was just going to suggest that. Let Carla May in first. Terrific, uh, Carla May. Would you like to go next? Thank you. Um, I would like to build uh, on a comment, really, to uh, to the insights that uh, Manu has given us. It seems our discussion is moving to the fact that there's an area or a territory that everyone has avoided. And it is interiority analysis. It is the area of the human consciousness out of which all of this comes and all of it goes back. I'm just going to recommend that Manu and all of us take a look at this interiority analysis where the cognitive and volitional action of the human being is spawned. And I'm just going to give a reference where that may be done. The master of interiority analysis, 
or consciousness analysis is not a psycho person. It's a philosopher. If you would look at the text, Insight, a study of human understanding. Bernard Lonergan is the author. Do not start with chapter one. Begin with the intro and the epilogue and chapters six and seven. Then if you dare, read from the front. That's all I'm going to suggest. I think that what Manu has been given giving us the magnificent insights of Gandhi have to be empirically grounded in consciousness analysis so that we can begin to monitor how our consciousness operates with a fourfold pattern and the biases that absolutely destroy it. I'm just going to uh, cede now to Bob. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, well, Ma Manu, I have three quick comments about the various things that, that were discussed, and you could respond to any of them, none of them, or whatever, and I'll try to do it in two minutes. So the first one is taking off on what Gail said about people really wanting democracy, um, and you're pointing out that all the surveys show that it's being eroded, that I, I think part of what's happening is when they did surveys on Obamacare. And when they asked about, are you for Obamacare, many people said no. But then when you add, when they asked instead, are people for including pre-existing conditions, are people for, you know, for that, people said yes, they want that. That I think the labels carry certain baggage that people who are in, in the cult mindset automatically damn them because of the, the labels. But when you get to the things that actually respond to human needs, people go yes. That's good. So that's comment one. Comment two is I wonder when you talked about the failure of nonviolent methods, um, you know, to me that brings up Gene Sharp and all his research showing how successful they've been. So if you can comment on that, so that's comment two. Comment three is in terms of acknowledging MAGA, whoever brought that up earlier. Um, that I, I think um, Marshall Rosenberg, if you're familiar with him, the fellow who came up with nonviolent communication, um, really provides a roadmap for that where, you know, there were human needs and there were strategies to meet those needs. Um, we all, he says all human needs are universal. It's the strategies that are different. So if you're talking to a MAGA person or any person by acknowledging the reality of their needs, uh, and really staying with that and listening to them and validating that because we've got the same needs, that that's the way to connect. That's where you get the resonance. And then if you want to move to the a discussion on the difference of strategies, that's another story, but you don't even have to go there. Um, so anyway, so those are my three comments. Thank you. Oh, and I want to agree with the cult behavior. Um, I was involved with culty programming years ago, uh, briefly, and yes, what we're seeing is cult behavior. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, thank you. Obviously, any discussion of the application of nonviolence today, Gene Sharp is a name that everybody knows. Uh, and um, uh, I'm not sure what you want me to say about it. I, I is written extensively about this kind of thing. Uh, and many people refer to his work um, for the ways in which you make that stuff uh, viable uh, in contemporary circumstances. Um, it's not my my area per se, um, uh, that kind of thing. But I would I would Gene, everyone reads Gene Sharp, uh, and um, uh, uh, I, I think he's often credited. Uh, in fact, I think I recall this a year or two ago i mean people sort of trace things back to gene sharp where i would maybe say that there's a bit more be behind it uh but but it's fine i mean i it's a great place to 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 go and i i think it can be helpful and i would just leave it there i don't i don't have anything to add to that and the point about democracy and surveys um Rhetoric and language, I would agree with, can be. Hello, can, dear Jason. 
can 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 be a part of it um and i and i uh i would agree yes right that the way the question is framed and if framed differently people still so in other words we if the takeaway from your comment is we shouldn't lose faith completely that is people still do want democracy it's just that they right now they're turned against certain terminology um uh, yes i it's an optimistic way of looking at things that i hope is right let me put it that way uh i uh and and there maybe is reason to believe that too um which is you know uh what the 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 anti court uh, protests in Israel against what um, Netanyahu wanted to do there, for example, or to an extent, um, you know what uh, what's happened in the United States. Maybe you know, like there, there clearly there's a group of people who believe in the in the ideas. The question is how whether the numbers have moved at all or not. And polling is also something which has its own issues, and we can we want to be a little bit careful of that, although obviously political scientists, social scientists take that into account when they do them. Um, having said all this, I would say we don't want to be ostriches and put our head in, heads in the sand. Uh, there is a problem. Um, there is a problem, and, and it's, it's a global phenomenon, um, and we need to figure out why, like what is driving this? And I've given my explanation for it overall, uh, but um, uh, I mean, I think we, that that was, we have to go beyond that now. Uh, we, we, we need to sort of get into the nitty gritty of, of the ways in which democracy, global democracy uh, can be strengthened uh, and people's faith in it rekindled um, and, uh, you know, part of this is about, in my view, is about movements. Um, you know, movements build strength. Uh, movements support larger infrastructure. Uh, so if we rely only on a few elites or, um, you know, decaying parties, um, that's not going to be sufficient. Um, people's movements are the things that ground democracy. Um, so I would look to that. I would look to building movements um, as ways to to secure the future of democracy. And I'm sorry, I didn't totally, I don't remember your third point. It was on Marshall Rosenberg and nonviolent communication, speaking to people's needs rather than their strategies to meet those needs. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, and at the end of that, you agreed with the cult of personality thing. I mean, look, uh, just take a look at the U.S. Republican debates. Um, you know, a handful of people up on that stage um, would talk about people's needs, whether you agreed with them or not is irrelevant. They would talk. They tried to say, "Look, what we need to figure out is what do what can we do for people? What do people need? What do we do here?" Chris Christie was one of them. Asa Hutchison was one of them. And whether, again, whether you agree with Nikki Haley or not, whatever, at, at points they were saying these kinds of things and just has no traction. It has no traction. Uh, I mean, it, it makes for great sound bites. The news coverage is, is paying attention to them. But as far as anyone knows, at, at least according to the polling, um, the, the person who's not on that stage, who's not saying anything, is the one who's coasting to victory here. Uh, and um, that to me can only be explained by cult of personality, which is the it's impervious to any of this other stuff. Talking about people's needs can't break the cult of personality. Um, and the real question then is not about talking about needs or or that kind of thing. Uh, it is about breaking a cult of personality. Very hard to do. It's very, very, very hard to do. Uh, and that is beyond nonviolence. I mean, it, it's not just about Satyagraha here. This is about, you know, um, I, I, I don't know uh, whether this other work that was referenced might be of use here or not. But um, um, I think I think the strategies that need to be deployed now urgently are about breaking cults of personality. Great, thank you. Terrific, Manu, thank you. Um...
just as a moderator sitting on the side, it seems to me a lot of you are describing the failures of political parties as much as you're describing the failures of democracy. Um, but uh, maybe that's for another time. Um, we've come to the end of our allotted time. Um, so first of all, Manu, thank you. Um, this has been a great uh, set of sessions that you've delivered for us. We've been all over the place. Today, we've been really into the details of some of the challenges we're facing in the world right now. But it's amazing how many lessons can be drawn and how you've consistently shown that from um, the history and the formation of a country on the other side of the world. Um, I will just ask now um, if there are any final comments. And if not, um, just a, a thank you from all of us to Manu. And then for any other business, are there any uh, um, announcements or news anybody would like to share on other topics? And if not, um, I will simply give some news about the next book club. Okay, so uh, yeah, Gail, go for it. Maybe you were gonna mention this, but our next session will fit the format as being the second Saturday of the month from noon to 1.30 Eastern time. And um, so put that on your calendar. And uh, James, I gather you have info about that session? Yeah, so what I wanted to say actually is that uh, the author hasn't been um, confirmed just yet. Um, so we'll get we'll get news to you first, Gail, and you'll be able to share it with the rest of the uh, book club members. Um, but what I did want to mention, because Manu didn't, is that he has a book coming out and we've talked to him about doing some kind of um, virtual discussion about his new book, perhaps uh, in February when he has a break in his schedule, um, which we will invite all of you to, of course. We hope that also to be a conversation. Um, and before then, we'd be able to share with you um, a link to his book. Manu, would you maybe like to give us just to close final thoughts of what your new book is about um, and what topics you're tackling in it um, and how it will set forward? Uh, sure, thank you. So I've just gave a link to it. Uh, the book is a biography of Madam Pandit, Vijay, uh, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. Um, and it's been called uh, the definitive biography of her. Uh, the tagline is the definitive biography of one of the most iconic Indians ever to have lived. Uh, that's the publisher's tagline, not mine. Um, and uh, it's been endorsed by some pretty heavy hitters, Gloria Steinem, for example, and Inder Nui. So um, among others. Um, so you, I've sent a link, you can have a look. Um, I'm pretty proud of it. It took me eight years, five languages, over 40 archives, seven countries. There's a lot of work. Um, but uh, it's coming out. I'm nervous in two weeks and we'll see. Wonderful. Um, I would just ask Donna, you had your hand up. Would you like to yes, close us? I did because, well, um, I saw, thought I saw an email that said the next section will be in January on the second Saturday, January 13th, but that it was going to be a discussion, a, con a uh, yes. discussion of ourselves without Manu here to talk about his book. Is that what's happening? Yeah, you are correct. That was the plan. Um, so sorry, yes, I was referring will be in February. Um, so the plan for the next session, as Gail said, is that on the second Saturday, which um, you're right, is the 13th? Is the 13th? Um, yeah. yeah, it's the, it's the 13th of January um, to have a closed door session for you to have a discussion about the book. Um, I'll be here with Drea um, to support you, but it will be a um, open house for you the readers. So uh, come with your questions, come with your thoughts for each other um, and your comments. Um, and I think that's us ready to wrap for today. Yeah, I might just say that sometimes when we discuss the book after having read it, it's about what can we take from this book to help us move forward? Um, you know, how perhaps within those of us who are parts of CGS, you know, what, how does this might, how might this help us think about what we're doing? And, Anyway, thanks. 
and some powerful thoughts today about how to reach out to people from across the divide. Yeah. Um, maybe you're thinking about how we can put that into practice. Yeah. Um, so if that is everything, sorry, um, Bob, you wrote in the comments, yes, the next day, the next session is confirmed for the 12th, uh, the 13th of January. Um, that's us. Let's thank Manu. Thank you so much, Manu. You've been thank fabulous. You. Thank you so much for Just having me. Fabulous book and really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. James, did you want to stay on for a minute or? Yes, I will. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, great. Manu, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for having me. I We never got to William. This person posted a lot of comments. At the, I'm just looking at them now. He didn't yeah, ask but, to speak. He's yeah. welcome to. It was way too many for me to process too. And, I, and actually at the end, he just said, great presentation. Because yes. I was about to write to him a, a personal chat to say, mm -hmm. You know, if you have a question in there, you'll ha I can't pull it out. <laughs> you'll have to. But he then he just said great presentation. So I decided he's just a chatter. And uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Gail, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Is he new? I don't remember seeing him before. I don't remember seeing him before either. So I don't know the last name for him. Yeah, he said it. I asked him for his what his name was at the, before we turned on the recording, though, because I, mm. you know, I, I said I don't know you. And would you like his, to stop the recording now? I can do. Oh that. yes, yes, yes. Let's do that. 